Welcome to Paranormal Almanac. With your host, Kurt Sandvig. That's right, I am your ghost host, Kurt Sandvig, and on this week's edition of Paranormal Almanac, let's talk about haunted churches. But first, as always, we have shout-outs, that's right, we have shout-outs going out to Chris Jones, producer Chris Jones, Damien and Daniel, Eric, Joe, Marisol, Tanya, Aaron, Alexandra, Amy, April, Ashley, Becca, Brandon, Chuck, Cole, Dan, Donald, Dorian, Isabel, Jason, Joshua, Lauren and Phil Mangano, Lauren McCune, hey howdy hi, Lindsay Hahn, Manning, Martin, Michael, Seth, Robin, the Sean Bishop, Sherry, Todd, Jamie, and Elijah Hendrickson, Trudy, Vanessa, Vicky, Art Muffin, Autumn, Carolyn, Cindy, Derek, Dill, Ezra, George, Harley, Heidi, Roger, Ian, Izzard Breath, Jeff, T, Juliana, Carrie, Connie, Christopher, Lawrence, Leo, Liam, Loki, Megan, Nanashi, Paul, Ricardo, Russell, Seth, Scustin, Spencer, Suzanne, Tim, Voidtech, Audra, Bob, Cindy, Devin, Elizabeth, Gamerfan, J Mark, Jade, Jerry, Kenneth, Kim, Laura Pitts, Melody, Paula, Ricardo, Terminal Animal, What's That, Will, Alicia, and Jen. Again, special shout-outs to Joe and Stitch. This very special October Spooktober Spoopy-tober Paranormal Almanac episode is brought to you by Chris Jones, producer. Oh, I'm supposed to give out my P.O. box again, but I don't have that up. I just have a reminder to myself, hey, don't forget to give out your P.O. box again, and I don't have it ready, because I'm not a smart man. No siree, Bob. Um... Yeah, I'm just not a smart man. Let me see if I can find that uh, P.O. box for you, because I always forget it. I thought I had it on here. Doodly doo 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 dump. Well, this is this is professional. I'm gonna cut a lot of this out. All righty, I also have a P.O. box. A lot of people have asked me, "Hey, can you? Uh, where can we send you stuff? We've got stuff we want to send you, and we want you to have it. Whether it be haunted stuff, products, artwork to put up in the back that people can see it when they watch the live episodes, weird." T-shirts and shirts and, you know, Hawaiian shirts and tiki shirts and all that kind of stuff. Uh, What else? Oh, drinking accoutrement. I always like that. Alcohols. Hey, if you want me to uh, uh, shout out your alcohol, if you got an alcohol and you want me to shout it out, send it on over to me. You can send it over to Paranormal Almanac, Kurt Sandvig, 1812 West Burbank Boulevard. West Burbank Boulevard. That's that word. Number 7102, Burbank, California, 91506. Because since I butchered that, let me do that again. It's uh, Paranormal Almanac, Kurt Sandvig, 1812 West Burbank Boulevard, number 7102, Burbank, California, 91506. I want to thank everybody for the fun, cool, funky stuff that they've uh, already sent me. I got uh, the next live episode. Someone remind me to go like, ooh, look at this, ooh, look at this, ooh, look at this, because there's a lot of cool, fun stuff to show y'all. All righty, let's get right on in to Paranormal News. What time is it? It's time for Paranormal News. The... Oh, really? As soon as I get going, the the uh, phone starts going off. Oh, it's fine. The first story in paranormal news, unusual occurrences at your head office. This one comes out of New Zealand. New Zealand paranormal investigators made this official information request to the Department of Internal Affairs. Dear Department of Internal Affairs, information is requested in relation to a matter of considerable interest relating to your head office building at 45 Pipiti or Pipitia Street, Wellington. The following information is requested. All information that you hold about potential paranormal, supernatural, haunting-related occurrences in this building and its surrounds. This includes anything your staff has perceived or suspected may be out of nature, out of this nature, even if the DIA does not share their perceptions. This includes any notes, records, meeting minutes, or records, communications to staff, concerns raised by staff, and internal discussions such as on intranets or DIA message boards. Full information regarding any reports of unusual environmental observations, hard data from your aircon, temperature sensors, any electromagnetic sensory equipment that you may have, and 
and any and all environmental monitoring mechanisms that you have in place going back to when you first moved into the building in 2017. This needs to be broken down in absolute detail. And these guys are demanding. Uh, fourth, information about any measures that you have taken, plan to take, or are, have, considered taking to examine and or alleviate a potential paranormal situation. Yours faithfully, the New Zealand Paranormal Investigators et al. Man, these guys are demanding. I'll give them that. Like, good on them for it. But apparently, it's basically workers at a government agency in New Zealand to become reluctant ghost hunters because of an official inquiry from a paranormal group. I, I'm wondering if someone watched, um, what is it called, Wellington Paranormal? Um, the the spinoff from What We Do in the Shadows, it, which is, I like it. It's a fun show. If you haven't seen it and you liked the movie What We Do in the Shadows, yeah, Wellington Paranormal. If you like the movie What We Do in the Shadows, these guys were seen at the end of the movie, and it's kind of like a spinoff TV series shot in New Zealand, in Wellington, I'm wondering if someone watched that a little bit too much or not enough and thought it was real and we're like, holy crap, they got all kinds of stuff about aliens and pod people and UFOs and ghosts and everything else. So um, I don't know. I don't know what it is. But due to the nature of New Zealand's Official Information Act, it is the department is actually required to find answers to any questions asked by the paranormal group and provide the information in a timely fashion. An official response from the agency indicated that that is the case, and presumably someone is working for the country's Department of Internal Affairs is currently conducting a legally required ghost hunt at their headquarters for this information. That is insane. That's all it takes for them to be like, oh, shit, we better give them everything that we have on the paranormal and UFOs because they sent a very wordy, demanding letter. But I'm very eager to see what the response is, and I'm sure I will do an update uh, in another paranormal news regarding it because that is crazy cool. And in case you guys don't know, I absolutely love New Zealand. Never been there. Absolutely never been there. But Australia and New Zealand, I've said it before, I'll say it again, they just seem like the coolest people. They got their shit together, their heads on straight. Someone shot up a bunch of people with with automatic weapons? Well, let's ban automatic weapons, and they have no problem with that. Good on you, Australia. And then New Zealand, hey, you know what? COVID kind of sucks. Let's put a stop to it. And they put a stop to it. They know what they're doing. You know, I don't know if we're, we're going to find out about paranormal stuff from them, but... They know what they're doing, and I love them for it. Okay, up next in paranormal news, watch this. A Brazilian journalist believes that Virgin Mary appeared to him during a bicycle ride. It's uh, the, the synopsis is, it's on YouTube, the synopsis is, is a Brazilian journalist films early morning bike rides, believes that the Virgin Mary appeared in the footage to warn him about difficult times he would soon face in his life. As always, when it comes to a video in the uh, paranormal news, I wait until, oh, it's and this story is, has to be translated from Portuguese into English. Um, I wait until the actual time on air before I watch it and let you know what I'm seeing. But it says, a devoted a devotee of Our Lady, a North Miner from Yawaria, Wanaria, claims to have seen the image of the saint after recording a video while cycling with a group of friends. Three years ago, journalist Pablo Mesquita Magalhaes fell in love with the sport and usually walks at least 30 kilometers a day. I assume they mean bicycle. Um, he said he was alone and on the way. He met some colleague. It doesn't matter what he says. I was riding and I filmed it at the same time. At the time, I didn't see it. When I got home and I went to her watch the video, I noticed the image of Our Lady. I didn't even have to repeat it. The first time I saw it and said... Our Lady passed in front of me. I was impressed and went to show it to my mother, who is also a devotee. I asked what she saw in the video. She said that she saw the image of the saint and was moved. Okay, I want to be moved. I want to see the image of the saint. I want to see what's going on. I can't get the video to play. Really? Come on. There we go. All right, some guys biking. Hold on, let me pause this real quick. I'm going to set it up for you. I'll put it up on uh, on the Facebook pages, both Facebook pages as well. But it's... Uh, it's in the rain. There's three cyclists in front of them. I can already tell you that because it's the rain, I guarantee you it's going to be a raindrop on the camera lens. But, uh, but let's see. Uh, you know, maybe it's 
Maybe it's the Virgin Mary. I, I don't know. I don't ride my bike enough to know. Let's find out. The camera is getting cloudy. Cars passing them, which is causing light distortions on all the raindrops on the camera lens. Oh, that better not be. Oh, you gotta be. All right. So I was right. I'm going to turn the music down. So yeah, I was right. Um, Cars are coming at them with their headlights and there is raindrops on the lens, which is causing pareidolia. Cause, nah, it's not even good pareidolia, to be honest with you. Uh, that's causing a reflection that could sort of possibly maybe be the Virgin Mary, but I don't, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I don't see it. Uh, Be a devotee, that's awesome. I don't want to, you know, rain on anybody's parade, huh? because it's a raining video of people riding bicycles. But I I personally do not see it. All right, with that, let's move on to the next one, which is also a YouTube video. So let's uh, click on this one. And once it loads up, I will tell you what it is. And this one is Ghost Moves Chair in York Pub. And again, this is a, I think this is the same pub we've actually seen before, but we'll watch it anyway. Um, It's a security camera footage over the bar facing the wall or facing the the row of tables and whatnot. And there is a person, I'm thinking a guy that is standing there. Let's see. I like it when they don't tell you which chair to be watching. And you kind of got to see if you spot it. Guy's walking away. Oh, wait, hold on. I'm pausing right here. I'm going to pause right here and say there is a row of chairs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten little round chairs, all exactly the same, all around these little round tables. Then, behind that guy that just walked away, there is a different, completely different chair. A regular, like, chair with a back to it and everything. So I'm going to call bullshit, and I'm also going to call that it's the chair with the with the back on it, that has that's facing away from the camera for no reason being sitting right there, the only one like it, that's the chair that's going to move. I'm calling it now. Let's find out. Guy goes back, picks up something right in front of that chair. Nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. Keep your eyes on the chair. Okay. Oh, yep, it's the chair that I called. And it really looks to me like it has a string on it and someone is pulling that one random chair. (laughs) No, I'm calling bullshit on this one too. You can see the light reflect off a fluorocarbon line at about 24 seconds in just to the right of the chair. All right, let's see if that's true because that's exactly what I think. All right, just to the right of the chair. Yep, you can totally see just a brief glimmer of fishing line. Yep. Oh, you totally can. Yep. Calling bullshit. I'll post, I'll post it on the Facebook page as well, but uh, sorry for the people that sent me this in. I, I mean, I appreciate you guys sending me this for the paranormal news. I like it, but it's also very quickly debunkable. All righty. Let's move on to another YouTube video for paranormal news. Again, this was sent to me and the subject line in the email was, Sasquatch caught on a FLIR cam. Now, this is actually an old one, but I I don't hold it against them. I haven't watched it, so it's from 2012. But because it was sent to me for Paranormal News, I wanted to include it. I'm going to go big. It's only a minute long. Let's go in. Well, it's something. It's a big gray screen. It says FLIR, um, and there's something in the center. Yeah, I agree. There is something in the center, whether it's a guy or a Bigfoot. Oh, all right. Well, that was a pretty good... All right. Of the three videos that I've watched today, that was the best. I still don't know if I 100% buy it. Yeah, I don't know. I'll post it up on the Facebook page. You guys tell me what you think. It does kind of look like... I watched it twice just now. It does kind of look like a Bigfoot walks off to the right. So, interesting. I don't know what to say about that. You guys let me know on the Facebook pages. All righty. The non-videoed paranormal news... Kesha, who once had sexy time with a ghost, crosses over as a paranormal hunter. That's right. The singer, Kesha, will have her own show on Discovery Plus next year called Conjuring Kesha, 
which will follow the pop star and her famous friends as they talk spookies and hunt for ghosts at mind-blowing haunted sites. I gotta say, I want to be on the show or meet Kesha. I'm not going to slam her about the sexy times like this um, headline did, but uh, I'm very eager. I'll watch it. I'll 100% watch it. It says, Conjuring, Conjuring Kesha will manifest six hour-long episodes next year in cinematic, hands-on, paranormal fashion, according to the series' description. The 34-year-old pop star called the project a creepy bucket list. I think that's cool as hell. Um, An opportunity for the paranormal enthusiast who once claimed to have a sexy time with a ghost. I want to get more into that. Um, As the self-styled spectrosexual, that's someone who is attracted to phantoms, once claimed that her 2012 single, Supernatural, was inspired by a real-life sexual encounter with a specter. I've had a couple of experiences with the supernatural. I don't know his name. He was a ghost. I'm very open to it. There were so many weird topics on this record, from having sexy time with a ghost to getting hypnotized and going into past lives. She also launched a podcast last year called Kesha and the Creepies, which explores all things supernatural with her famous friends and other world skeptics. Over the course of my life, I've always been drawn to the supernatural and the spiritual realm. Making music, I felt, was a cosmic connection between my soul and something bigger that I couldn't explain. On this new show, I'll bring my friends to some of the most mysterious paranormal hotspots with me to explore. We'll explore life's greatest mysteries and an aim to catch something never before seen on camera. I think that's cool. I'm going to see if I can reach out um, to Kesha on, on uh, social media and see if I can get her on the show. Maybe just to talk about her show or to see what I can do to get on her show. Because I think, fuck it, that's cool. Good on you, Kesha. And if you want to, you know, look, don't fucking shoot Bigfoot. But you want to fuck a ghost? Yeah, I got no problem with that. Fuck a ghost. As long as it's consensual. Alrighty, up next in paranormal news. Can cats see ghosts? I love these. They come out every year around Halloween. Can dogs see ghosts? Now this one. Can cats see ghosts? Here's what Animal Planet star Jackson Galaxy says. He said, My Cat from Hell, which offers helpful tips to cat guardians and their favorite felines, aired for 11 seasons, blah, blah, blah. For instance, he says, The senses of cats are more heightened than those of humans. Yeah, no shit. For instance, their low-light vision is far superior to ours. Yep. Between dark, between dusk and dawn, the crepuscular hunters, crepuscular hunters needed to be able to see at low light or almost no light, depending on the moon, in order to still catch the prey. They also have the tapetum lucidium. It's a Harry Potter spell, uh, which is a layer of tissue behind the retina that collects all the light and then reflects it back, essentially guaranteeing generating light in their eyes when there is none. They can also hear about one and a half octaves higher than us. Oh, these are just facts about cats. Where is the... Do you believe that cats can see ghosts? Um... Here we go. If you believe in the spirit world as I do, then it's much easier to take the leap that your cats are experiencing something in a realm that's beyond the physical rather than just staring at a blank spot on the wall. With all of a cat's heightened senses together, if there are ghosts or spirits available to us in our physical realm, cats will be able to see them, sense them, and experience them far more quickly than we can. Well, you know what? I believe that animals can see stuff. I mean, there's been so many stories of from even listeners, like on the live shows, about cats and dogs obviously seeing something. So, yeah, I can get behind that. I don't think that asking a cat expert will ever answer it because how the fuck do they know what cats see? But still, sure, why not? Yeah, I'll say yeah. Alrighty, up next in paranormal news. Man, there's a ton of it. Um, Stormy Daniels and her haunted doll... Look for ghosts at Safety Harbor Restaurant. You know, there's a reason that I can't get Paranormal Almanac as a TV show. It's because every celebrity is doing their own paranormal show. Where the hell were you guys 10 years ago when I was still trying to do this and you guys weren't interested in it at all? Now it's like the cool, hip thing to be into, apparently. Uh, Let's see. Last month, Wilson's Eatery. I don't know who Wilson is. Giggle Waters Social Club and Screening Room. Uh, She was an investigator on the travel show Paranormal Paparazzi. She went by her maiden name. Um, She said, uh, years later, I buy a restaurant. We realized very quickly we're not the only ones here. Last month, her eatery drew the attention of another television paranormal investigator, Stormy Daniels. Yes, that's Stormy Daniels. So apparently Stormy Daniels is now doing this, um, looking for ghosts. 
All right. So apparently this woman has an eatery called Giggle Waters Social Club and Screening Room. I kind of want to go there. That's just a great name. But um, they said that a bartender got a flash of a little girl in a white dress, thought it was Wilson's five-year-old daughter giggling in the movie theater. She thought the girl wanted to play hide-and-seek and started to look for her. But Wilson hadn't brought her daughter in that day. She said it used to be a funeral home, so in the doors into our theater, 9,000 bodies passed through there. That was the viewing area, so our theater tends to be the most active. Other workers have also seen the little girl there. Um, there's just more stories about it. Uh, she said once the kitchen door swung out, swung shut out loud, she said stop it, and the door opened wide again. This seems very cool. Hey, I, w- I want to go to this bar more than I want to uh, paranormal investigate with Stormy Daniels. And I will, I would gladly paranormal investigate with Stormy Daniels, but... The reason I wanted to add this one on here, if you guys want to have some fun, if you guys are big fans of Stormy Daniels' work, uh, I was an extra, non-nude, in a Stormy Dan- Daniels movie. Uh, so find find me in that and take a screenshot and I'll send you a prize. How's that? But you have to be right. And don't just start sending me a bunch of screenshots of like people doing it from Stormy Daniels' movies. That's not what I'm talking about. All righty, I think we're at the last one. Yes, well, um, second to last one. 25-year-old woman thrashed to death during exorcism ritual five held. This is yet another story of an exorcism gone bad where it was just basically like domestic violence against a woman that ended up killing her. A 25-year-old woman was allegedly thrashed to death with a hot iron chain by an exorcist and some of her relatives during an exorcism ritual to, quote, free her from the influence of an angry deity. The police have arrested all five accused uh, involved in the alleged incident that took place on Wednesday. So, again, another one, another horrific thing where people immediately go, oh, she must need to be exercised and ends up killing them. And it just bums me out to no end. Uh, Look, there are professional exorcisms out there, exorcists out there. That, you know, if you don't know what the hell you're doing, don't kill someone because you think that they're... uh, (laughs) <laughs> that they're possessed, because that's just fucked up. It really is. All righty, finally, in paranormal news, let me pull it up so I can get you guys the details. I uh, I already brought this up on, um, I already brought this one up on the uh, Facebook page, but I didn't get a chance to talk about it on air, so I want to make sure that I talk about it on air. You guys know about Cielo Drive. Oh, my voice just cracked. You guys all know about Cielo Drive, right? Cielo Drive, the place where Sharon Tate was murdered, the horrific murders of Sharon Tate, uh, Cielo Drive, where David Omen has his house, and you can go there. I think it's coming up actually pretty soon. Um, You should check out uh, Last House on the Left, I think it's called. I don't remember what it's called. Something Cielo Drive, Ghost Drive, whatever. Look up David Omen on Facebook. You'll find it. He's got listings for his next ghost hunt that I can't make, unfortunately, at his house. Uh, He does them all the time, but... A house right next door to David Omens is for sale. That's right. If you want one of the plots that used to be the land where Sharon Tate was murdered, it's up for sale. It's $3 million. It's three bedroom, four bath, 10090 Cielo Drive, Beverly Hills, California, 90210. In fact, in the photos, you can actually see a photo of uh, David's house from the balcony. Uh, it's a yeah, it's a great house. If you guys love cliffside houses, if you ever seen the footage from David uh, uh, David Oman's house, it looks very similar to that. It's multi leveled, right there on Cielo Drive. You can actually see it. Probably, I'm gonna guess right now that I'm right, but you can probably see it in the movie, um, in Quentin Tarantino's movie. But uh, so, if you guys want a possibly haunted house. There you go. And you have $3 million lying around and you want to live by David Omen, have David Omen as a neighbor. No comment there. Uh, Check it out. It's for sale. All righty. That about does it for Paranormal News. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. Paranormal. We are back. And on this edition, let's talk about haunted churches. Look, I don't care whether you're religious or not. There's just something beautiful about churches and slightly spooky to me about churches. Even the most hardcore atheist has to agree that 
whether it's the architecture, the quietness, the style of most churches, there's something awe-inspiring. But what about those churches that aren't so quiet? Let's talk about those. Let's talk about churches that, for whatever reason, are scary as crap because they seem to be haunted. All righty, the first one starts way back in the 1700s. For a very, very brief history lesson, most churches at that time were built to convert the evil savages of the land over to Christianity, which, as you know, is never evil or lascivious. Yeah, it's bullshit. All right, so right here in California, Spanish settlers started building churches up and down the coast, and in 1823, Padre Jose Altamira built the last of these churches. They're called the Mission San Francisco Solano. Well, this one was anyway. In just 10 short years when it closed, the mission had baptized thirteen over 1,300 Native Americans. But let's not skip over the part where 900 of those Native Americans died because of mistreatment by Padre Jose Altamira and other Spaniards and exposure to European diseases. So they weren't resistant to those. But, uh, you know, I guess, thankfully, they were baptized. I don't know. Anyhow, those bodies were buried hastily on the church's grounds. Yeah, uh, I guess they weren't exactly saved as far as what they were expecting. So Father Altamira was so cruel to the Native Americans, he was actually forced out of the mission when they rebelled and kicked his ass to the curb. So he's gone. The rest of the history is peaceful, right? Yep, Mission San Fernando Solano must be peaceful. Nope. There are many stories, and I mean a lot of stories to this day, of people seeing Father Altamira in the priest quarters there in the church. Although I will say, it wasn't really a priest quarters, they don't think. They just named it that because his freaking ghost is seen there so often. He's called the Demon Priest of San Francisco Solano. All right, let's move forward to 1906 when an earthquake damaged the buildings and the ghost activity really seemed to kick off. A priest is often seen walking the halls, keeping an eye on the buildings, and other ghosts are heard there wandering the grounds, touching guests. EVPs are all over the place, loud bangs, door slammings. All of it is seen and heard there. Then... We got General Vallejo's soldiers' ghosts are seen there. Why? Well, because across the way in the build, one of the buildings for the, uh, for the mission, General Vallejo and his soldiers were there for quite a while. So his ghosts, his soldiers' ghosts are seen and heard there too. But the reason I started with this one, the reason I wanted to do a Haunted Churches episode is because what is seen here? I'm saving the best for last. A freaking bear ghost is seen here. Oh, now, uh, I mean, like, a, like a, the, the ghost of a bear and not like nude bear. It's not like a nude ghost is seen there. No, a ghost of a bear is seen here. I gotta say, I equally wanna see and also never want to see the ghost of a bear come walking down the hall of a haunted mission. That, that's a good twist. That is a new one. Good on you, Mission San Francisco Solano. So if you guys, um, I think it's the, I gotta say, I think it's the first ghost of a bear on this show too. So again, good job, Mission San Francisco Solano. You can tour it and hopefully you'll see the ghost bear or the ghost of an a-hole padre for yourself, but uh, there seems to be a lot of activity there. So if you're in the San Francisco area and you want a cool place to check out that you can walk through that they'll you know give you a tour through, I highly, highly recommend Mission San Francisco Solano. I know it's high up on my list of places to go. All righty, moving on, let's head on over to Spring Hills, Pennsylvania to the Egg Hill Church 
to the first debunk on this episode. But let me give you the ghost story first. A crazy pastor of the Egg Hill Church killed all of his parishioners right after. So basically what he did was he gave them poison communion. They all started dying. Once they were all dead, he hanged himself. So people have reported hearing the cries of child victims and ghosts are often seen wandering the church and its grounds. All right, big problem already. This is a huge story. If a, if a pastor killed his entire parishioners by giving them poison communion, there'd be a news story. There is no newspaper accounts of murders occurring at Egg Hill Church. There are no death reports attached to the church. No priest hanged at the church. No name of any victims or of the priest himself. Anywhere. It's the same BS regurgitation about this story over and over and over again. So sorry, interwebs. This story is bullshit. And it was a pretty easy debunk, too, because of the lack of any details or names. That's the first red flag that makes me go, all right, I got to look into this. And then I start scouring through all the newspapers in the area, again, expecting there to be, maybe not on the front page, maybe they want to hide it a couple pages back, but some story about, like, uh, local pastor killed all the parishioners, giving them poison communion. Make sure you uh, check your communion. Check the body and blood of Christ first before you eat it so you don't die as well. Nothing, nothing even remotely like that. So I'm begging you, paranormal investigators everywhere, stop going to this privately owned church. Leave them be. There's nothing spooky there. The church has even put stuff out saying, hey, this story's fake. It's not true at all. Please stop breaking into our beautiful little old church so you can do bullshit paranormal investigations trying to find the ghost of the parishioner who said the body of Christ. Fuck that. Leave them alone, man. It's sad when a church has to go, please leave us be. Because I guarantee you if people were respectful and just wanted to go and visit the old pretty church, they could. But the church has to go, nope, leave us alone. Nothing spooky here. All righty. Debunk out of the way. Let's go to a quick one from England. And it's an abandoned church named the St. Mary the Virgin in Clofield, England, which is built in 1350. I know, like, international listeners, when you hear, like, 1350, you go, oh, yeah, that's, that's old, no big deal. But to Americans, that's crazy cool. I want to go see a church that was built in 1350. Now, locals believe the church is haunted by the devil because the altar of the church faces the southern direction. Towards hell, they say. Why is hell to the south? I don't know. Maybe it's hotter the south, you know, the farther south you get. It gets hotter. So maybe people are like, well, that's where hell must be. I looked into it, though, because I didn't know that was a thing, that, you know, churches shouldn't face southern directions. And apparently, the orientation of Christian churches reflects the historically documented concepts that one should turn eastward to pray and the architectural and liter liturgical principle that temples and churches should be constructed facing east, often specified as the equinotical east. This is because the east faces towards the holy city of Jerusalem, which is where, in medieval writing, God's presence was said to be the strongest. I didn't know that, so I learned something that I'll probably never ever use again and I'll forget in a week. But for right now... I learned something, so hopefully you guys just learned something about that too. Another unusual feature of this church, though, is that nearly all of the gravestones sit against the wall of the graveyard. Due to the area being cleared of gravestones in the 1970s after an incident of graveyard desecration. That is insane that there was so much graveyard desecration at this one church that they had to be like, fuck it, just get rid of all the headstones. Just put them up against the wall. That way they can't find the bodies and they'll just start digging holes. Like, screw these people. That is insane. So the legend says that it's proof the church was used in satanic rituals, despite the fact there is no evidence of any of this. But still really freaking bizarre 
that all of these, and maybe it's just the same, like, one or two guys. They dug up one, and they were like, woohoo, I found a ring. That was pretty easy. Woo, let's do another one. Let's do another one. And they just kept going until finally the church was like, all right, dude's enough, and then took all of the headstones away. But that's still a pretty messed up way to go. All right, so the church was abandoned after a replacement church was built in a more convenient location in town in the 19th century. All right, so what's seen here? Well, a lot of hooded ghosts, possibly monks, are seen here, as well as the typical moaning, touching, cold spots, voices. And I got to say that I don't know if it's if there really are a lot of hooded possible monk ghosts or if it's people are seeing the same three, but it's in almost every eyewitness thing. Yep, we saw a hooded ghost. We thought it was an old monk. But as you know, when I start talking about the typicals, moaning, touching, cold spots, voices, it's time to move on to the next one. And so I will. Up next, let's go over to Virginia to the Aquia, Aquia. Oh, God, I did this earlier. Aquia, Episcopal. Oh, fuck you, church. Aquia, Episcopal Church. I got it. That should have been applause. Nope. Nope. Where's applause? There we go. Akia Episcopal Church. That's right. I did it. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this church was built in 1751, burnt down in 1754, rebuilt in 1757, and this church has a crazy amount of American history, like Thomas Jefferson and George Mason were church members there, and George Washington was directly connected to people who attended there regularly. It was like a who's who, and I realize it was in Virginia in the 1700s, so chances are it was going to be a who's who of, like, founding fathers, but still, pretty freaking cool. It was spared by British troops during the War of 1812. It served as a Union army camp and hospital in the Civil War. Now, on to the origin of the spoopy. In the uh, mid-1700s, a young blonde woman was traveling the roads near the church when a highwayman group stopped and attacked her. Now, legend says she ran from the men and into the church. They followed her in and discovered her in the vestry, where they did absolutely horrible, horrific things to her, up to and including murdering her and leaving her body in the vestry. Now, the church was closed at this time for a few years and didn't reopen for another few years, some say a full decade. All right, they reopen the church. The clergy start, you know, cleaning the church. They go down to the vestry, and they're like, holy crap. And they discover a skeleton down there with, quote, long, beautiful, blonde hair. They said that the blonde hair was so vibrant and shiny and so shockingly beautiful, it should have been off like a woman that was just standing there. Like it was, you know, sparkly blonde. I don't know what this woman did her hair like, whatever shampoo she used, they needed to use that in the commercials. Like, even if you get murdered viciously 10 years ago, your hair will still be vibrant and shiny. But anyhow, so they called the authorities who took the skeleton and uh, buried her. But the wood floors of the vestry were stained with blood. And witnesses say no matter what they did to the floors, the blood stains would come back just as dark as ever. So finally, they ripped up the wood floors to try and stop the bloodstains. They named the ghost Blonde Beth. Uh, it's, you know, basically, they nicknamed her. Uh, she's been spotted over the years throughout the church. A custodian working in the graveyard saw a woman's, a ghostly woman's face floating above the graves. Another man saw a woman smiling at him through the balcony windows before she vanished. That's got to be messed up because they said that, you know, you know, she's a beautiful looking woman. So you see this gorgeous blonde smiling at you, woman. And you're like, you know, sm woman smiling at you. And you're like, oh, yeah, this is awesome. Hey, howdy, hi. And then boof, she vanishes. Now, members of the church have heard footsteps walking around at all hours of the day and the night. The footsteps will break into a, quote, frantic run around the church. Noises can also be heard in the vestry that some witnesses have described as a struggle, then a thud. Then uh, there's sometimes a groan, a whistle, or even a call for help by a woman have been heard there. And a lot of witnesses see a woman in the window of the vestry. But in the 1990s, 
there was a celebration of Akia Church's bicentennial anniversary. So the church invited a group of Civil War reenactors to camp on the church's lawn because it was like a three-day event. So they're like, just camp out here, you know, be part of the thing. It'd be great. And they camped out between the graveyard and the church building itself, which to me sounds like an awful invite, but they did it. So a few reenactors actually witnessed a, quote, red and orange flickering light in the vestry. This light swayed back and forth and then flickered on and off the entire night. Now, other people cons- confirmed that they had seen the light, too. So they went to the father the next day, whose name was Father Kerr, I believe it was, and he explained the vestry at that time had no lights installed, but it's been seen many a times and was probably Blonde Beth. He also explained to the uh, to the reenactors that there certainly wasn't a light bulb, um, had no electrical wiring, no lights, but she was probably very concerned because the Civil War had come back. Sure, that seems reasonable. So I guess if you're um, in that area in Virginia, uh, go check out Blonde Beth and tell me how blonde her hair is. Is it really that like amazingly blonde? Why do so many people talk about her blonde hair? That's, again, good on her. All right, next up is rated high on my BS meter. It's the Amherst Synagogue. It was built in the uh, 1980s, but, quote, built atop the woods where a child murderer would dump the children's bodies after killing them. No. No, no. Nope. So, no year, no name, no news articles, no anything backs this up. Again, if you have a a serial killer that's killing a bunch of children and dumping them all in the same little batch of woods, it will make the news. I don't care what decade, what year, whatever, it'll make the news. But then get this. <clears throat> when they were building the synagogue, three workers were working when a wall collapsed, killing them. Some say... They saw a spirit of murdered children push the wall down onto the synagogue workers. Nope. Again, absolutely nothing backs this up. And get this, every story, not surprisingly, every story about this place is the same regurgitated verbatim online story without ever giving any details or changing in any way, shape, or form. But anyhow, I I don't believe any of it. I don't believe that the Amherst Synagogue is haunted, but here's what supposedly what happens here. It's the basics. Voices, shadows, knocking. Oh, I saw a bunch of children, um, murdered children's ghosts running around. All right, moving on because I don't believe that one. Let's go to France. In the forest of Lyon, you will find the ruins of La Abbe de Mortemer. Now, this is from the 12th century, but by the 15th century, it was home to hundreds of monks. But then, in the 17th century, it started to decline. By the time of the French Revolution, Mortimer Abbey housed only four monks, and many scholars say that over from the 12th century on, Hundreds of monks were murdered in the abbey, especially by the state in 1790, in the wine cellar of the abbey. So we're going to jump forward to 1863 when it was purchased by M. Delarue. Now, stories say they immediately, the whole Delarue family, immediately had paranormal activity. They would frequently see monk ghosts, strange lights, doors and windows opening and closing by themselves. In fact, it got so bad that the Delarue family had the entire grounds exercised, but the monk ghosts, yep, they kept being seen. And also, the ghost of the white lady is seen here. And it said, if you see the ghost of the white lady, misfortune or death will come for you. Now, there there was also a room that had the bulk of the paranormal activity. It's known as the pink room, according to M. Lerdu, who became the Abbey's owner in the 1960s. Now, he said he experienced nightly paranormal activity in that room, and once he learned about those exorcisms, he traveled to Nice to speak with M. Delarue's daughter herself. 
She told him, you're going to ask me about the pink room. She said one night, a young girl, fiance of M. Delarue's son Charles, son Charles, came to stay and was given the pink room to stay at, who said the entire night she heard and saw ghosts. They were so loud, she couldn't sleep a wink. She announced she would never live in such a house, broke her engagement off, and went back to Paris. Now, the next ghost story I could find here, I'm not going to do a little move forward, uh, happened in World War II when an English paratrooper bailed out over the forest and was spotted by the enemy. So he was being, like, basically chased by the en enemy when a monk emerged out of the forest and led him to the safety of a resistance cell that the guy didn't even know was there. Now, when the paratrooper turned around to thank the monk for getting him safely to this resistance cell, he said the monk disappeared in front of his eyes. So, if you're in the area, you don't mind a bunch of monk ghosts, and I guess you don't mind the possibility of seeing a white lady harbinger of doom type ghost, you should check out the ruins of La Abbe de Mortemer. All righty, let's go back to New York uh, to Most Holy Trinity Church. It was built in 1841 by Father John Stephen Raffiner, or Raffiner. It was then rebuilt as a two-tower brick building in 1854. Now it's a twin-spiraled, spired um, building, church, that is uh, still in East Williamsburg. Now the church's adjoining school is built on top of an old cemetery. The church itself mentions, oh yeah, not all the bodies were relocated. You know, just like poltergeist. You think people would know that bad shit happens when you build on top of burial grounds. Why is this still a thing? Like, why does this happen so often? And I get this was in the 1800s, but even in the 1800s, you should have gone, how about we don't build a school on top of burial grounds. Nah, you know, let's move the bodies at the very least. All righty, let's see. The church's adjoining school, uh, burial grounds. Yep, yep. Here we are. Guests say they have heard strange noises and the sound of a person walking back and forth while trying to sleep in a room. Um, wait. Heard the sounds while... Oh, I get it. Uh, heard the sounds of people walking back and forth while in 1872, sorry, I flipped a line there. Uh, my notes aren't as clear as they should be, Kurt. Um, all right, so in 1872, its second pastor, Monsignor Michael May, died in his room, there we go, we're back on track, on the second floor, and the room is kept as a spare bedroom only because of the paranormal activity that keeps happening there. It got so bad that no other pastors would stay in the room, so they're like, screw it, it's a spare room, and when guests do stay there, they say they heard strange noises, people walking back and forth, and they couldn't get any sleep in the room. They said phantom footsteps have also been heard on the staircases in the building, and dogs who were once kept as pets in the rectory would stare in, quote, a trance-like state down the basement stairs, refusing to go down there, as well as into the dining room where the building got cold. And they said it wasn't just a slight cold. They said the entire dining room would get extremely cold for no reason out of nowhere. Moving in time to 1897, church sexton and bell ringer George Steltz was actually murdered in Most Holy Trinity's vestibule. Now, some sites say that the bloody handprint of the killer is still present in the stairway leading to the church's bell tower, but I gotta say... I can't find any photos or videos of it that I say are reputable. And and even if I'm trying to find like non-reputable ones, there's just not a lot there. So I'm going to put that as a grain of salt. But it does seem to be true that George Steltz was murdered in the vestibule. And parishioners say that George can still be heard roaming the halls and is responsible for the occasional unexplained ringing of the church bells. There are a lot of witness reports about the bells ringing, and there's no one there doing it. Now, lights in the school gym go on and off for no reason, and at nighttime, the sounds of footsteps walking back and forth can be heard in the school building. So a ton of paranormal activity is still going on in this church. Uh, again, you know, it's East Williamburg, it's New York, uh, the Most Holy Trinity Church. 
All righty, let's go over to New Orleans and the St. Louis Cathedral. Now, this one is located in the New Orleans French Quarter. It's said to be the North America's, it's said to be North America's longest continually operating Catholic cathedral. The cathedral was originally built in 1727 for the canonized French monarch, King Louis IX. Uh, it burned to the ground during New Orleans' uh, Great Fires of 1794. It was rebuilt in the 1850s. Then the current church was upgraded from cathedral to basilica in 1964, which, again, hopefully you're going to learn something because I did. Uh, it's basically a promotion for churches. If it goes from cathedral to basilica, it, it went from like, assistant to the regional manager to regional manager. Uh, so uh, again, good on it. Uh, its most famous ghost is the ghost of monk Pierre Dagobert, who in defiance of New Orleans' newly installed Spanish governor, he performed funeral rites for six executed Creole rebels that were left to rot outside the cathedral as an example to would-be revolutionaries, basically. So uh, Pierre was like, nope, not happening. And he not only gave them last rites or funeral rites, he led a procession of the slain men's families through the streets of New Orleans, loudly singing the funeral mass in his, quote, distinctive baritone all the way to a grave for these people. Now, Pierre uh, died of natural causes in 1776, but he can still be heard singing in the church on rainy days for some reason. And some, some witnesses claim to have witnessed the robed monk leading a phantom funeral procession from the cathedral doors through a nearby alley and then disappearing. Now, there are other ghosts that are seen here, like the ghosts of both infamous murderer Madame Delphine Leloy and the iconic voodoo practitioner Marie Leveau. But they're both said to be seen in the church, but I don't see why either would be here because I can't find any connection to them and the church during their lives. So I have a feeling, and this is just my own personal feeling, that they add that so they can put it on the tour, like they always have tours of, you know, Marie Laveau's places or the Lowry uh, Mansion or whatever it's called. I have a feeling they just kind of, it's a touristy traction thing that was added to this church, which doesn't need it because that has cool shit without it. But St. Louis Cathedral that's the place to go if you're in New Orleans. All righty, on to another haunted New York church. <laughs> Man, I got to say, if you want to see a haunted church, New York is the place to be. I mean, that's I get that they probably have had a lot of churches and it's been around a long time, but I would hazard a guess they have more haunted churches per capita than any other state or city. So anyhow, it's called the St. Mark Church. It's in the Bowery, New York. It was built in 1660. The Builder Petrus Stuveson died in 1672 and was buried in a vault in the chapel. It was rebuilt in 1795 to accommodate, quote, the growing community. And uh, moving forward to 1978, a fire almost com completely destroyed the church. That's another thing I've noticed a lot on this, from doing all this research, is fires and churches don't go well together. Uh, okay, so what is seen or heard or who or what? Well, the first one has a very cool name. The first person that's seen here, oh, it's just Peg Leg Pete. That's right, Peg Leg Pete, also known as Peter Stevenson, which I'm assuming is the builder Petrus Stevenson, uh, who was considered a stern man and a world traveler. The story says that he lost his leg when he was in Cura uh, Curacao on military business. When he finally came to rule New Amsterdam, even old New York was once New Amsterdam. Um, that's, that's a quote, if you guys know. If you don't, it's They Might Be Giants. Listen to it. Uh, he was famous for both his stern behavior and his wooden leg, which he kept wrapped in silver studs. That's right. He had silver studs all over his leg. So over the years, many church attendees, visitors, and the staff themselves have reported seeing and hearing Peg Leg Pete, mostly because of his peg leg. But I want a shirt that says, like, I saw Peg Leg Pete. I would buy that. Uh, people have reported seeing strange movements and shadows within the church's windows while walking by on the streets. In addition, the bells at St. Mark has also been known to ring at odd times, often accompanying a sight. You guessed it, 
of Peg Leg Pete. But he's not alone there because a ghost woman is often seen in the pews and the balcony wearing 1800s attire and vanishing if you try to get too close to her. If you just sit there and watch her, apparently she'll be there. But if you try to get too close to her, she vanishes. Now, there's also another known ghost here. His name is A.T. Stewart, who was buried in St. Mark's Church. Um, Maybe. I'm going to put it maybe on there because there's a lot of sites that say that he was buried there, then his body was stolen and held for ransom when his wealthy wife paid. She was like, screw that, and she moved his body to another cathedral. But I don't know if that story's true or if it's legend. So... A.T. Stewart might still be buried there, but good old A.T. is still seen here. Woof, is still seen here. I got to drink some water. Uh, He's still seen at the cathedral, walking all over the place, and apparently is so recognizable that everybody's like, oh yeah, there's old good old A.T. Stewart. All righty. Then there's this grain, huge grain of salt story from from a website about the hauntings at this church. And the story says this. I talked to the Reverend Richard E. McAvoy, Archdeacon of St. John's, but for many years, Rector of St. Mark's, about any apparitions he or others might have seen while in the church. Now, legend, of course, has old Peter Stuvisant rambling about now and then. The Reverend proved to be a keen observer and quite neutral in the matter of ghosts. He himself had not seen anything unusual, but there was a man, a churchgoer, whom he had known for many years. This man always sat in a certain pew on the right side of the church. Queried by the rector about his peculiar insistence on that seat, the man freely admitted it was because from there he could see, quote, her. The her being a female wraith who appeared in the church to listen to the sermon and then disappeared again. At the spot he had chosen, he could always be next to her. Now, I pressed the rector about any personal experiences. Finally, he thought he had seen something like a figure in white out of the corner of one eye, a figure that passed and quickly disappeared, and that was about 10 years ago. So, I don't know if that's a tall tale or if that's true, but if it is true, good on it. This one guy's like, man, I'm going to sit next to this chick all the time. She's, she's like a wraith, and she disappears right after the sermon, but, you know, check her out. Like, good on him. Hey, if you're going to go to church all the time, you might as well see a ghost. I don't know what I was going to say there. I had no ending to that sentence. All righty, moving away from New York, let's go down to sunny Key West, Florida, to St. Paul's Episcopal, Episcopal, oh, I hate the word Episcopal, apparently. St. Paul's Episcopal Church, built in 1833 or 1838. It's hard to tell. Now, legend says it was built on land donated by the widow of land baron John Fleming on one condition. That condition, that her husband's remains were never to be removed from the grounds. Now, the church was destroyed by fire in 1886 and was destroyed again by a 1928 hurricane. It's said that the hurricane was so strong, it ripped bodies out of the ground from the church's cemetery. That's, that's a strong hurricane. And again, another church destroyed by fire. I mean... You guys got to start making fireproof churches here. All right, so the ghost that's seen here the most is supposedly, and if you haven't guessed it by now, you should have, is supposedly the ghost of John Fleming. He is angry about his grave being lost to time and hurricanes. How they know that is beyond me. I mean, it's not like they see the ghost every night and he's always like, I'm angry about my grave being lost. Woo! No. It's just a ghost, and they went, well, that's got to be the ghost of John Fleming. And remember that one condition? We probably shouldn't have lost his or removed his grave from the grounds. We probably should have kept an eye on that grave because that's the only thing that she told me, that crazy widow of his. I don't know. It seems like a big grain of salt. But what they do see is a misty, see-through man apparition dressed in 19th century clothing. What's also seen here. Ghost children. That's right. Ghost children have been seen and heard huddled around a statue of an angel on the church's ground. Rain of salt story time. Uh, The children were killed in a fire set by a clergyman who went mad when he discovered his wife in a tryst with a deacon. Nope. No. No news story about any of that. But people say they see a bunch of ghost children huddled 
and Hiram huddled around a statue of an angel on the church's ground. Now, another ghost that's seen in the graveyard is the ghost of a sea captain or a pirate, apparently. Uh, his grave was in the cemetery, too, supposedly. Couldn't find out his name or anything about it. I I would like to know more about the pirate ghost. Because if you want to see a ghost, for me, if you want to see a ghost, obviously the ghost of a bear quickly shot up to my number one. I want to see the ghost of a bear. Uh, but two, right below that, ghost of a pirate, man. That's got to be up there. Even Peg Leg Pete. I mean, he's still kind of piratey. I, I'd put him up on that list as well. And then, you know, obviously ghost of children. I, I don't want to see that. That's they're, they're just creepy as all get out and scary, and I don't need to see them. So they're way down on my list. But, uh, yeah, lots of ghosts, lots of churches, lots of fires. Stop burning churches. If, you, if, if you're part of a, a group of people that, that will go around and just burn churches, don't, don't do that. Stop burning churches. They're, they're very cool buildings. You don't have to be religious. Just don't build it. Don't burn a church. Don't burn a building. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Um, oh, but that about does it for this first haunted churches episode. What do you guys think? There's a ton more. I could keep going, but I hit the hour, and that's kind of what I was going for. Um, what do you guys think? Would you um, is seeing a ghost in a church more or less frightening, or not frightening at all? Just like oh, it's another place where you can see a ghost. For me, for some reason, because it's a church, not for some reason. Seeing a ghost there is extra spooky. You know, you're already in a church. It's the house of God. Even if you don't believe, it's the house of God. It's a it's a beautiful old building with a bunch of crosses and some guy nailed to him on the wall. And then you see a ghost, especially like a ghost monk. I didn't I didn't rate the ghost monks. I'll put them above uh, ghost children, below uh, pirate in sea captain, which is below peg leg Pete, which of course is below the ghost of a bear. Um, I don't know. There's something extra spooky about seeing a ghost in a church for me. And I don't know why that is. It's probably just because, you know, like the whole religious up, you know, when I was brought up, uh, you know, you got to respect the church and got to be quiet and you got to do what they say and you got to stand when they say and kneel when they say. And, you know, if you don't, you're going to burn in hell and you better drink the blood of your God and then you better eat his body right after you drink the blood. There's a lot of shit that makes it all kind of woo-woo spooky. But uh, so maybe that's why. But I don't know. There's something about it. But I do dig. I got to say, if I want to go to a church, I want to go to a haunted church. There's a lot of haunted churches out here around the world. And there's more on the list. I mean, like I said, I kind of stopped. But, um, yeah, there's a lot more that I can do a second episode. Maybe I, maybe I can get to it right away. I don't know. I kind of want to do it for October. I always want to do the spooky stuff. But I want to do each one a different spooky topic. So we'll have to wait and see is all I'm saying. There, I'll get to it. But hopefully... You guys enjoyed the Haunted Church episode. Once again, I'm your host, Kurt Sambi, and this has been another spoopy edition of Paranormal Almanac. I got a little grass on that. Sleep to it. Sleep to it.